I am live. Hello, everyone, and Ooh. welcome to Cold Reads. You liked that, didn't you? <laughs> welcome to Cold Reads, presented to you by Resonant Moon Audiobook Solutions. My name is Laura Nicole, your fabulous host, and welcome to this is episode 11 of Cold Reads, where we are going to be reading part one of Stonebriar Case Files Bad Alchemy, chapter nine. With me today, I have uh, two glorious uh, guests with me, helping me out with some voices. Uh, as yesterday, we had uh, Jason Banks still with me because I'm still at his house. Hi. <laughs> and I also have EverStar's Greg Howe with us as well. How you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Awesome. So I'm going to have you both reprising your roles uh, as Jason as Eric Moonrunner and Greg as Turek, respectively. Um, so because you guys just embody the characters really well, I couldn't have asked for better voices. Yay. Uh, and well, Greg, you love the goblin voice anyway. Yeah. Um, when, when we did an interview for... Uh, Valley Free Radio, uh, you did, you used him in your song uh, Dolls and Ghouls or Girls and Ghouls? Boys and Ghouls. Boys and Ghouls. That's yes. right. <laughs> and it was so good. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Have you been to Balticon? He has not been to Balticon. He needs to go to Balticon. You need to come to Balticon with me next year, apparently. Apparently. I, the, more peop the more people I can feed my meat, the better. <laughs> Jason does love to feed well, his people. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> nurse. Hey, I will be so glad when we go back to the old hotel. Like I'm not. Yeah, we need to. Uh, but that's a separate topic for a separate podcast. I got to derail. It's what I do. I know, but we want to make sure that um, because we are all super nerdy, and uh, Greg is uh, in taking a break from his D and D uh campaign to be with us so we really appreciate well, it's, you it's actually my child's D, D campaign which is even more nerdy i have, right. taught, I have taught them because how you are, to learn. you are building on a, a wonderful tradition of parents creating uh campaigns for their children gotta, yes. raise, gotta start them early exactly i got a new dice bag from you i'm super excited yay that's because yeah. i'm an alcoholic and i've got a lot of crown royal bags there you go <laughs> All right, so it's a, free, it's a free bottle of whiskey with every dice bag. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right, so we're really going to get this started now. Thank you all for for being patient. Um, so uh, let's do a quick recap here. Um, do do do. Okay, and this is presenting to everyone. Perfect. Um, so thus far, Beatrix Stonebriar has returned to the elder wood as part of her administrative leave uh, because she had an attempt on her life in the human world. Oh, magical creatures are real and they have been uh, exposed to the human world and have started integrating. Um, some better than others. Some better than others. Beatrix Stonebriar had an attempt on her life, which um, was no good, no bueno. Um, and so she went back home for some R and R, but when she got there, there were seven tulip heads with baby wildling Flay uh, dead in front of her house. Um, she went to go investigate and met up with her old friends, uh, Turek and Eric Moonrunner, um, went along discovering different, uh, clues as to who has... Um, who perpetrated this crime. Um, Eric and uh, Beatrix have been searching the libraries while Turek has been scouting the area looking for the people that uh, they suspect have uh, committed this crime. And so they are about to meet up. Before they meet up, however, um, while in the care of uh, Beatrix's mentor, uh, she is cursed and dies for the second time um and is brought back to life by an elixir and some really forceful resuscitation <laughs> um and so now we check back in as uh eric and beatrix are heading to the willow well to meet up with 
Turek Mudrain. Is everybody ready? Yes. Indeed. Uh, very good. Well, here we go with chapter nine. I had stopped at my tree to take care of my bruises, and then I was able to fly to the willow well. Eric kept stride with me at his normal size. We rushed to the well. The news that we discovered was too great to sit on for, for long. In our haste, however, we got there long before the sun was to go down. So we waited. There was no light conversation. We just sat together. Minutes dragged on painfully, attempting not to turn into hours. I pulled out my notes and started reviewing them. I had to be sure this was not a mistake. There was a hope, a glimmer of hope that I could be wrong, but it didn't feel like I was wrong. Eric could no longer, Eric could sit no longer. Like a human, he was restless. He paced around the well, then sat down. Then he was back up again, scouting the tree line and underbrush. Then he would come sit down. He stared at me. When his eyes, when my eyes met his, I could see that he was weighing out something. What? I asked. The sun will still be up a little while longer. His grim expression softened. What if we distracted ourselves with each other? I wished I hadn't asked the question. You can't be serious. He continued to look at me lustfully. Did we listen to the same interpretation of the scroll? How can you possibly be in the mood? If it's going to be the end of our civilization, do you want me to die wishing that we had? Wishing that you had what? Turek's voice came from the shadow of the trees. As he approached, he was wiping his knives on his tunic. His skin was darkened in some places where there was blood splattered all over him, particularly on his knuckles. Say you're not moving in on my Beatrix, Moonrunner. Your Beatrix? I asked. I knew he was joking, but still, there was something to that statement that bothered me. When did I become property for someone to own? Oh, come now, Trix. Didn't you know we've been fighting over you for at least a century? Eric would not look at me. He was glaring at Turek. You guys are having me on. Knock this off. They were both glaring now. Earnestly glaring. As though they had never been friends. Turek sneered. You have no right to her. She knows what kind of elf you are. His fists clenched around his knives. He took a stance, ready to pounce on Eric. Eric readied himself, even though he was unarmed. Come on then, Mudrain, and to the victor go the spoils. I watched in abject horror as my two dearest friends started, have, started to have a battle over me. It wasn't right. I knew both would get in a few blows, but be at a stalemate for a few minutes. When Eric disarmed Turek, I knew that I had to be, I knew that I had at least a little more time. Something had to be causing this interplay. I wasn't sure if it was some kind of haunting or a curse, but I was listening to my gut. Rummaging through my pack, I found my book of counter curses. There was one that was a beginner and, and curse spell that would work on most simple curses, but I had to find it. The two males rolled on the ground, evenly matched. Where Eric had his height and long limbs, Turek was sturdy and his center was lower to the ground, making him harder to overpower. When he got one of his knives back in his hand, I knew I had to move quickly. Finally, I muttered as I, as I located the right spell. A quick cast and activation words sent a pulse through the area. The grunting figures on the ground slowed their breathing. The anger that had glazed their faces washed away. Realizing what had happened, they helped each other up off the ground. Turek hastily put his knives back in their sheaths. What was that? Turek asked. Something I hope never happens again, I responded. Eric, you're right. The goblin looked him over, the shock of the last few minutes evident. 
Eric was winded, but managed. Nothing. That a little time and rest won't cure. You still have a solid kick. He laughed and then clutched at his stomach in pain. How about you? I know I didn't give you most of those bruises. Turek tentatively <clears throat> examined his face and his hands. Oh. He said as he found one of the swelling points on his brow. A few rowdy centaurs had a few many nettle ales and wanted to go out and cause some trouble with humans. I figured with everything else going on of late, that wasn't something I could turn a blind eye to. Turn a blind eye to? I asked. I could hear my master's words in the back of my head. Well, yes, not all of the border patrol is still is just beating up people now, you know. Sometimes it's the kids going out into the world to see what it's like. Other times, it's someone coming home for a family visit with family or an emergency that means life or death or someone crossing the border. I use my lie detector and my own discretion in those cases. Lie detector? Eric's ears perked up. I do not suppose you have that tucked in your back pocket. I do, actually. <gasps> He produced a thin box that slowly opened and expanded to two feet wide. There were several sizes of handprints on it, a divider in the middle, and on the other side, a few dials and several lights. I'm impressed, I said. When did you get one of these? Oh, I saw it in one of those cop programs. It was one of the ones that had several initials. I cannot keep them all straight anymore. But I thought if humans had this type of machine, then surely I could find out what it does and have the goblins and trolls build something just as effective. And he this is it. He spread his arms proudly at the work of his people. It's not bad if I do say so. Finally, something they put together collaboratively. And as a side benefit, it helps me do my job. How does it work? Eric was fascinated. I'm not sure of all the ins and outs, but the principle is that each being has their own chemical makeup. So this dial is used to determine the species. When the species lies, they give off a chemical reaction. In the case of trolls, they cease giving off chemicals. When the machines detect those, the lights glow. For the, re the reason for so many lights is to determine the stress level or something like that. Oh, I could, e I could have a field day with one of these, I said. Do you know how much easier my interrogations would be? Turek considered for a moment. He started to fold. He started to fold up the lie detector, he said. This one's just a prototype. If there's a market for making another one, I'm sure they could make one for you. After all, they are in your debt. If you have one, it could promote some kind of trade with the human world. That could be, but it should be negotiated with law enforcement first. I know how some of the troll investors can be, inventors can be. If they have a chance to exact some kind of pain on the liar, they would likely set that up. And it could... Tricks. Eric said, cutting off my tangent. Oh, right. I fell silent. We all just stood there, looking at e over each other. My two friends were a little worse for wear, but no serious damage. Turek broke the silence. Well, what did you mean by the end of our civilization? And that is the end of this episode. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> if you want to find out more, you should tune in tomorrow. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at 8.30 p.m. You may appear for the whole seat, but you'll only use the edge. Exactly. <laughs> um... <laughs> So I like this episode. Um, now, before the episode, um, we were talking about the challenges of doing a straight read as opposed to um, as opposed to having other people voice the characters. And what was it you were saying, Jason? Well, I, I, you, I think me and me and Greg, we have the easier part, right? We only have to talk as one character, whereas you have to find a way to manage the narration voice, which is your straight read plus your character's inner monologue, which is the voice of the character, but it carries a different intonation. And then you actually have to do the actual character voice, which includes all the emotional intonations that you need for the scene. 
which is why I very rarely uh, voice a book that has a male protagonist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's just um, the nice thing about um, this story is A, I wrote it. Um, B, Beatrix has just a higher tone in her voice than I do. And the cadence of her talk is basically me speaking as like she is my dream acting role if I were tiny. <laughs> um, I'm short. So I could probably do a hobbit at some point, but we big feet, eee. hairy feet. I, I do have hairy toes, but that's that's so we still come in three sizes. We, not so we, and friggin' huge. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, Greg, what did you think about uh, what was coming up? Oh, it was how yeah, it was it was really nice to to interact with yet another voice. Mm -hmm. And you're gonna do it again tomorrow. I'm excited. Yay! Yay! Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm here for. I know. I'm so excited. Um. So yeah, I, I think this is a short episode, but this chapter is like on the border of the the length that I would go in one episode. I try to do no more than four pages in an episode, and this chapter chapter is five pages. So I broke it in half question mark. Um so double the pleasure. Double the pleasure, double your fun. Um I love that gum. It, it's such a statement of the great men. Indeed. I need a twin. Where are my twins? <laughs> you don't see very many gum commercials anymore. No, you don't. You see Mentos, though. Yeah, but that's not a gum, though. No, but it's a fresh maker. <laughs> Why did you turn that around? Anyway, um, so since I have two guests, I'm going to go ahead and let you guys uh, figure out who wants to go first with pimping your stuff. Um, I can go first. I literally have been doing the same self pimpage for so long. It's yep. literally second nature now. All right. So, <laughs> Greg, tell people where they can find you and what you do online. Uh, so, we are, uh, my, my production company is actually getting their, their act together at this point. So, we will soon have a homepage. But right now, the best way to get hold of me still is through my Everstar project which is uh, facebook.com forward slash Everstar Music. And uh, soon we will be tied together with the uh, production company, which is Old School Music Productions. Very nice. A musician. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everstar, you should check out the Everstar Music, music pro uh, Project. Um, he was doing a song a week. No. Are you still doing a song a week? No, we ended after a year. Okay. So, so we, we did, did a song a year for a year. So 52 songs, some of, my favorite, some of my favorite original music has come from this. I would just like to let you know that most major uh, label artists don't put 52 songs out in a year. I am aware of this. <laughs> you know, Balticon has a musical track where they have musical guests. <laughs> so clearly, you and I need to take a road trip on Memorial Day weekend. I, I hear this, apparently. Yes. Yes, and I can think of no better person to, to take with me. Um, I love you, Val, but you live far away. Oh, <laughs> whiskey and bourbon and the, scotch. There and cigars is. And there is. And Crown Royale, I'm imagining. Y yes, actually. Crown Royale rides really and, good, actually. And um, also Tuaka. Tuaka is the unofficial. It is the taint of sweat of the Roman Legion, and uh, it'll put hair on places that you didn't think you'd have hair. <laughs> Laura's laughing because she knows me. <laughs> I do know you. I think I've made you taste uh, Tuaka before. No, no, I'm talking about all the hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that too. <laughs> It'll make you a Sasquatch. Pretty close. <laughs> and then we can do our hair funky colors and it'll be great. Woo! A neon pink Sasquatch? I'd watch that. I don't know what show that is, but I'd watch it. <laughs> um, all right, so... Mr. I've got my pimpage memorized. I do. Let's go. 
as always, you can find us at the Talk Nerdy to Me podcast on TalkNerdyToMePodcast.com. That's Talk Nerdy to Me with the number two. You can always find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Nerdy to Me. And, of course, you can find us on the Twitter at Nerdy to Me Podcast. And all of these links are listed in the show notes. If you like what I'm doing and want to be able to get this pop-up as soon as I go live or as soon as you get onto YouTube and see, oh, look, Laura put up a new episode, you can go ahead and click that subscribe button. I would really like that. And once I get to 10 subscribers, I'm going to be super excited. And you will contribute to my joy in being alive. Um, you can find more about Resonant Moon Audiobook Solutions at ResonantMoon.com, where I do a whole bunch of services, including audiobook QC, uh, podcast editing, uh, audiobook editing. I am not taking any narration contracts right now because I am currently under contract for a three-book series, which I'm super excited about, um, and I have to get working on it. So one book at a time. One look at them. And you can find me online um, on Twitter at L Nicole Audio. You can find me on Facebook at Stonebriar Case Files. Um, and someday I will actually do a cold reads page. Uh, maybe once this gets more established, you can find me right here on YouTube. Um, and if you want to be on this show, you can go ahead and send me an email at Laura Nicole Audio at gmail.com. That is L A U R A N I C O L E A U D I O at gmail.com. Um, if you're going to submit writings uh, to me, make sure that they are under four pages long um, and a complete story. And please be sure to tell me what the rating is so that if we need to put a rating disclaimer, I can make that happen. Because she wants all the saucy bits. I do want all the saucy bits. I'm waiting for Nobilis to submit something to me. Because I would have saucy bits with tentacles, I'm sure. Fun times. Um, so anyway, Calamari. thank you so much. I'm sorry? Calamari. Calamari. <laughs> Hot calamari. Um, so thank you so much for being with me. Um, we will see you again tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, for part two of Chapter 9. Uh, so, gentlemen, say goodnight. Goodnight, gentlemen. Oh, goodnight. Goodnight.